Dune Part 2 is the second half of the adaptation of the 1965 novel Dune by author Frank Herbert. Of course, we got Dune Part 1 back in 2021, which was an uh, interesting time. We were still very much in the COVID-19 pandemic. We were about a year <laughs> yeah. and a half into everything that was happening there. And so the, the cinematic landscape was totally different. Of course, Dune Part 1 was a very much hotly anticipated film. A lot of people were looking forward to it. It also had been adapted a couple of times before. There's the David Lynch movie from 1984. There's mm -hmm. the sci-fi miniseries, which came out in the early 2000s. Dune Part 1 had a lot of fans of the book and then, of, of course, of those subsequent adaptations. And it comes out, it does really, really well, I think, in spite of all of the circumstances that were happening at the time. The movie made a little bit over $400 million at the worldwide box office. And that that's considering that it did indeed drop day and date on HBO Max when they rolled out that year-long plan to release all of their theatrical films on their streaming service at the exact same time. Um, on top of that, the film went on to be nominated for 10 Academy Awards, walked away with six, and so highly celebrated film. But one of those films that didn't necessarily guarantee that more were going to be made. I think a lot hindered on the success or the failure of what that movie was going to be. Thankfully, I think we can all sit here and say they went ahead and made the sequel. They went ahead and made the second half of that first novel. So this is adapting, again, just one book, but split into two parts over the course of these previous two films from Denis Villeneuve. And now Doom Part 2 has arrived in theaters after a couple of years of production and then about another four or five months delay due to the writers and actor strikes of last year they wanted to go ahead and push the movie back so that everybody a part of it could mm -hmm. actively promote it and be a part of that theatrical rollout and finally we got a chance to lay our eyes on this movie this past weekend and check it out in all of its glory so uh yeah with all of that out the way man i will pass it over to you as we kick off this conversation as we kick off this extended talk about the film what did you think about dune part two the movies are now healed I think the movie going experience coming from the pandemic, all the ups and downs, I think we are now healed. I think there's different milestones um, that comes with, again, that the, the, the cinematic going experience uh, in, in, in its healing process. You know, a lot of us, we, 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 we talk about Top Gun Maverick. We talk about uh, Nicole Kidman and her AMC ad. Uh, <laughs> I think Barbenheimer last year was an important milestone as well. Um, there's a lot of things in between there, of course, too. But I think this is the, the final one to me personally. I think this is the one that's like, yeah, the movies are back and people love going to the movies again for a cinematic experience. Uh, and, 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 and this movie encompasses, I think, uh, almost a celebration of that, almost a celebration of what it what it really looks like to have a sci fi blockbuster that people are itching to go see. Uh, man, we'll we'll, uh, we'll talk about, um, um, of course, the, the box office and things like that at some point. But it's just knowing, I think, the the hunger for this movie, seeing seats being bought up as much as they are, seeing three fifteen a.m. showings <laughs> for this movie gives a lot of context on how much hype is surrounding this film and i am i'm here to say that it lives up to all the hype that it, it, it that 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 came before it that predated it um i was pretty high on dune one already uh i think knowing that it was a part one a lot of the problems people have with that movie i didn't really have because i think going into it i knew I had a feeling where things are going, where the where uh, uh, Denis Villeneuve might end that story, um, and I was very very happy with that product. But I'm here to say, Doom Part Two was all of that and more, so much better. Um, and I, I I knew it was possible, but to actually see it on the big screen, I think is a is is a whole another ball game, um, man. Because you know Frank Herbert's text uh, wasn't you know only created with Middle Eastern language and customs and culture and politics in mind. But uh, in the conversation of religion, he makes crazy commentary in this movie or really in, uh, or in, in his book about how people can be manipulated to religion and the ideas of prophets. And the, the, the long story short, the world of Dune is crazy. That text that Frank Herbert had is thick. And to be able to convey it this way with this energy uh to to make it look like this to make it feel like this and for it to be comprehensible is a whole nother level 
of success to me that I think this movie embodies. And so in case you couldn't tell, I absolutely love this film. Denis Villeneuve is is doing uh, a, a lot of his best work here as somebody who I've, I've now come to love for for years now, man. I mean, he is he's he hasn't missed. He really hasn't missed in a while. Um, and uh, he 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 comes from from the ilk of making crazy movies like Arrival and Sicario and Blade Runner twenty forty nine and one of my most underrated favorite movies ever in Prisoners. Man, he knows what he's doing now, and this is I think this is the biggest stage he's ever been on to produce something that feels I think this bombastic of a movie. Uh, and and um the performances in this film timothy chalamet steps the hell up i know a lot of people were like critical him of the first one i don't know about this and that and then when you realize that these are all acting choices that benefit this movie it's like nah yeah this dude is doing something different timothy chalamet stepped up completely i think in 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 this movie he feels really good in that way uh rebecca ferguson and javier bardem i I, I think that we'll take, they literally took these characters and made them not only their own, but they brought forth so much that they needed to, again, in text and subtext <laughs> that's in the book and brought it to the forefront. Javier Bardem is one of the, the more fun parts of this movie. Rebecca Ferguson, I think even anti up the ante on her performance in this movie, I absolutely loved what she was doing. Uh, and everybody surrounded it too, Zendaya, and there's just so much here and there's so much um that that so much more that some of our key players had to do in this film technical aspects i mean the way it looks is absolutely ridiculous i don't even know how to talk about it or where to start there but again to be able to convey scale has been denny villeneuve's strong suit for a while now to be able to convey these crazy ships that that ex exist in the world of dune to be able to convey sandworms this crazy uh, uh, these ridiculous, crazy creatures that live on the planet of Arrakis is just insane, and 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 one of the best, um, one one of the best scenes coming out of this movie is uh, Paul Atreides learning, learn learning how to ride a, a a dune, a sandworm, and it is absolutely phenomenal. It's, but to be to be able to convey that on screen is something I think David Lynch wasn't able to do. That's something that Denny Villeneuve was like, "No, nah, I got this, bro," <laughs> and he was able to bring that I think to the forefront and make that one of the craziest parts of the movie, um, uh, uh, especially technically uh, that that we have seen him really ever do. I think he even went on to say it was like one of the hardest things he's ever shot. And when you see it, you're like, "Yeah, I can understand how that would be one of the hardest things you've ever shot." It's definitely difficult um, um, to convey. Uh, there's, there's again, I could probably rant and talk about this movie. Um, any and, and all day. But the, the, the main thing I want to convey here is that Dune has become an event um, and it has become another world that we can dive into. And I feel like we've been missing that for a while on this, I think to this degree, right? Like we've had, Star Wars has had its time. Uh, Lord of the Rings has had its time. Harry Potter has had its time. And now, even though Dune has been around a while, now that it's being more popularized, people are now reading the book more than ever. People are seeing this movie again, like crazy right now. I, I feel like it's like, oh man, we finally get a chance. Something else has come around that we can sink our teeth into. We can jump into this world and enjoy the characters, enjoy the politics, enjoy the culture that's in, that's enriched within it and have, a ton of conversation about it and so this movie is absolutely impressive um Denny Villeneuve man he 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 is uh, again been been cemented as one of the best sci-fi directors of all time I think he's also one of the best tension directors of all time looking at Arrival Sicario and Prisoners in, in in particular uh there but man this 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 movie I think is 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 no exception uh to the greatness that Denny Villeneuve has created for himself and in in at the end of the day um, I think we'll get one more from him and, and Messiah. I can't wait. This movie does end on a comma. I think people will criticize that too. Like, oh, this movie ends on a comma, but that's how the book ends. The book also kind of ends on a comma. And you're like, well, I guess I got to wait till the next one. But if you're not excited for Doom Messiah after seeing this movie, I don't know what to tell you. I think that is going to, uh, uh, it, it gets weird. The story gets weird, but I think what the, again, the, the vast world he's built, the culture we we've built in the, in the text that Frank Herbert had, Denis Villeneuve has, has done it with Doom Part 2. And this movie, I think, will come to be celebrated as one of the greatest sci-fi movies of all time. Uh, so, look, this is, a, this is a special movie. There, There's really no other way to put it. This is something special, and I think everybody 
who's been able to see it, who's been able to talk about it, kind of realizes that and they realize how much of a unique proposition this entire experiment is, has been. And now that we have the conclusion of the first book, Doom Part 2 is nothing short of a phenomenal cinematic achievement. I think it's the ultimate manifestation of why we go to the movies, us as fans, why we go to the theater and go to the cinema, because it reminds you of what's possible and what's really capable on that huge silver screen when you're in the hands of a visionary filmmaker. And for me, as I was watching Dune Part 2, it was a reminder of those widescreen, technicolor, Hollywood epics that used to get produced in the 50s and the 60s, movies like Ben-Hur or Spartacus or Lawrence of Arabia or Cleopatra. Those films were huge in scope and scale. And what's interesting to me is that at that time in the 50s and the 60s, those movies were often produced to combat the rising popularity of television. And I think, ironically enough, 70 years later, we're kind of back at that same exact spot. And Denis Villeneuve has talked about this a lot, about some of the things that have happened in the television industry that have maybe negatively affected the theatrical going experience. And when you make a movie like Dune Part 2, it's a clear reminder of why I don't care how big your TV is, there is no way you can replicate <laughs> the possibilities and what's capable on a huge silver screen. And I know we say this often on this show, you and I will urge people Go see this in the movies. Go go to the theaters to check out this movie. See it on the biggest screen that you can. I am here to tell you that you must see this movie in a movie theater. Whatever premium large format screen you have access to, if you want to witness this for the first time ever, you are truly doing yourself a disservice by not paying money to go see this in a movie theater. I'm just being honest. It's not pretentious. I know that it's one of those things that everybody doesn't always feel like they have to do or they can wait, but I really implore people that if you want to understand and feel what a movie feels like on scales that we rarely ever see, if you're going to spend your money on one movie this year, then Dune Part 2 is probably that movie you should be spending your money on. I'll just say that because the sound in this film is thunderous, the cinematography is stunning visually. I think that this movie is pretty much in a league of its own. And the entire experience is really, for me, transporting and immersive in a way that we rarely see in most movies that come out in this day and age. And another thing that I thought about and I've been thinking about since we saw the movie is the fact that, you know, our generation, we grew up in the visual effects revolution. You know, what James Cameron did with The Abyss, what Steven Spielberg did with Jurassic Park, that kicked off the visual effects revolution that we've been living in for the past 35 plus years, where to now, almost every weekend, dozens and dozens of films come out each year that have so much CGI, so many VFX shots. Some movies have thousands and thousands and thousands of shots. And I think by and large, we see a lot of these films and we're like, oh, that looks really good. That's impressive. But at the same time, I think that we've seen so much of it because we grew up in it and we've never existed in a cinematic landscape without it. We've kind of become desensitized to it. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about like future movies that we're going to go see in a couple of weeks, like Godzilla X Kong. I'm, I'm excited mm -hmm. about that movie. I'm looking forward to it. But if I'm being honest with myself, though, the visual effects are technically impressive. They look a little cartoony. It's not mm. of this real world. It looks like another fantastical place that doesn't even exist in any semblance of our reality. And for that movie, that's okay. But at the same time, I think every now and again, a film comes along and it reminds us of what's truly possible when the vision, the time, and the care are there to make something that not only feels epic and grand and huge, but it also feels real. And Doom Part 2 feels real in a way that most big budget blockbuster movies do not feel real. And I think that those visual effects mixed in with the practical in camera work that Denis Villeneuve is very, very much good at. It's some of the best that we've seen in the 21st century. And, and those effects are only plussed by the incredibly stunning cinematography from Greg Frazier, who is on a magnificent, wonderful run right now in terms of cinematography. He's just doing the Lord's work behind that camera. It's unreal oh, how great and how grand he can make things look inside that camera frame. And then when I distill it down and I think about Dune Part 2 on a story level and on a character level, the film raises the stakes in almost every way from Part 1. 
it deepens the connections that we have with all of the main characters. You get really, really memorable performances. Timothy Chalamet kicks it up to another gear in this movie, absolutely. Zendaya once again proves why she's probably the biggest star of her generation. Austin Butler quite possibly comes in and becomes the MVP and steals the movie completely. Javier Bardem is having a wonderful time. Rebecca Ferguson brings in the weight and the gravitas that you need with the story. And of course, because there is incredibly compelling source material with Frank Herbert's novel, Doom Part 2 and the script also starts to explore really interesting thematic ideas. You get these, these, these conversations about the power of religion and belief and faith and the, the, the dangers behind messianic figures and the oppressive nature and, and the collateral damage that might be that might be caused by those charismatic leaders. And, and I think I think when you combine that and this really interesting story and these really big, heady ideas, these huge science fiction concepts, these religious concepts, you pair that alongside the technical aspects, which this represents the best in world class filmmaking that we might ever see in this generation i mean you have one of the most impressive films that i think we that we might may have ever gotten in hollywood history it's really on that type of level of just epic scope grand scale storytelling which cannot be taken for granted we have to really remember and realize like this this is this is special which is why i started the way that i started and 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 ultimately i think because of this movie Denis Villeneuve, I said it in our out of theater reaction. He has to be in the conversation for for being one of the greatest science fiction filmmakers of all time. He's up there with James Cameron and Steven Spielberg and Ridley Scott, all these people that we often praise and hail. Um, and I think ultimately the completion of this story, both Doom Part One and Doom Part Two, they're probably going to go down as his magnum opus. This is probably going to be the unquestionable masterpiece of his career because I. I don't know how you can get any higher than this. This might be the apex mountain for him to borrow a term for, for, from another podcast that I really like, but it's really up there. I will say, though, all of that out the way and said, I don't think it's a perfect movie per se. I think it's a perfect film going experience. I think it's a perfect theatrical experience, as you could probably ever ask for. As a movie, I don't think it's perfect. I do have a couple of small nitpicks, nothing that took away from my enjoyment but things that I have definitely thought about since I left the movie. The biggest one for me is that I think, I think that there's a conversation around the pacing of this movie. And, and, I, and I'll say that the pacing in Doom Part 2, in my mind, is unquestionably better than the pacing of Doom Part 1. Just because Part mm. 1 had to establish so much, it had to introduce so many characters, build the world, really just throw us into this grand mythos and lore. There was a lot of setup that needed to happen. And so I think the pacing here, absolutely better because it throws you right into the action. However, that being said, by the time we get to the third act of this movie, I couldn't help but feel that it was somewhat disjointed and potentially rushed. And, 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 and my main example of that is the character of Fade Rotha, which is played by Austin mm -hmm. Butler. I feel like it might have been better to introduce that character in part one and then have him reappear in part two. And I only say that because without giving anything away, if you haven't read the book or if you don't know the story, he's a primary antagonist in this, in, in this story in particular, in the first book uh, there's, there's a couple of big showdowns that happen. And for me, because we don't see him until this film and we also see him pretty late into the movie, a little bit over an hour into the movie, although it's an, it's a spectacular sequence in which he's introduced, there just wasn't enough of him. I just wanted more of him. And I mm -hmm. wanted him to feel like the final boss that he should have felt like by the end of the movie. Be mm -hmm. Because by the time we get to the, the end of the movie, I think that there just could have been a little bit more, a little bit more gravitas behind what happened because that particular sequence and also some of the character choices and changes that they made on the part of Zendaya's character, Chani, those didn't hit me as hard as I thought that they would only because either in the case of Austin Butler, not enough time, or in the case of Chani, uh, a little bit telegraphed throughout the entire story. If you if you understand Dune and you know where it's going, you you can kind of understand like what's happening with her, even though they do change some things. You can kind of see it throughout the course of the movie, like, oh, I see what they're probably going to go for here. So I just felt like that those final few minutes could have had a little bit more of a an emotional gut punch for me that I was looking for. It didn't, it didn't leave me feeling the way that I thought it would have let me felt like so many great sequels have in the past. But that, that that's a small nitpick. Um, and another just really small one, I don't know if it does the best job at conveying the passage of time. Um, that's one mm -hmm. of the things where it's like, that's a big key component in the first book where you clearly know like how much time has passed between certain events. Yeah, and they, do, they, they, they change some things again here, which, which kind of you know play and subvert that 
Um, and, and there were times throughout the movie where I was just kind of wondering, well, well, how much time has passed? How long have we been here? Come to find out it was really like six months. It wasn't that much time, but I wish that was a little bit more clear throughout the movie. But again, those are obviously like really small nitpicks. Like that's it. Everything else in this movie pretty much is just flawless and perfect. And again, I think that this is going to easily end up as one of, if not the best movies of 2024, one of the greatest science fiction films ever made, one of the greatest sequels ever made. And as I said earlier, probably the unquestionable masterpiece of Denis Villeneuve's career. But speaking of him, I do want to talk about him more as we continue this conversation. And if you've not seen Doom Part 2, that's okay. We're going to do our very best to not spoil the movie or the book, but we do want to talk about this movie more because there's just a lot to it. There's a lot to soak in there's with this movie and other, and other avenues that I think we want to explore. And first and foremost is the visionary filmmaker behind it. You know, as I started off everything, as I mentioned, this is not the first time that Dune has been adapted into live action. It's, it's, been, mm -hmm. it's been efforts before. Um, I think valiant efforts, um, but, you know, just due to budget restrictions, the time, technological advancements, like certain things just couldn't be achieved in 1984. You talked about the sandworm sequence. There was no way they could pull that off in 1984. It looks so silly in it, 1984. It looks crazy. It looks so silly. It's like we're doing like a Broadway version of what this could be, <laughs> like at best, maybe an SNL sketch at best. Mm -hmm. um, and even the sci-fi miniseries, that's a that's a network television show, or not, mm -hmm. but a cable television show, I should say, which has a very limited budget. Now, big budget behind this, big studio partnership behind this, a visionary filmmaker who's been working for the better part of 25 years, who knows what he's doing, can come and take on this type of project. Um, what, what, what do you want to say about Denis Villeneuve and, you know, why, why he put, perhaps is the perfect type of filmmaker to take on this project? And he's just proven, I think, time and time again throughout his career that not only is he capable, but he has the, the institutional knowledge, he has the wisdom, he has the experience, and he also has the passion and the love because he's talked about how this has been kind of his dream project for all of his career to make Dune into a live action movie, a theatrical movie. So he also has that personal connection to it as well. So what, what do you want to say about Denis Villeneuve, his, his journey to get to this point and also kind of the culmination of all his life's work to make this, this two part Dune epic that he's done recently? Man, Denis Villeneuve is so interesting. Um, I know both of us, you know, I was kind of watching you on Letterboxd, you know, uh, but, but I know both of us, you know, we kind of did our deep dives into Denis Villeneuve and his filmography, you know, how, how I wanted to know, and I needed to know how we got to this point. I had movies that I hadn't seen yet in my blind spot. I, I can't, I, I, I was running around calling Denis Villeneuve one of my favorite directors, but I hadn't seen all of his movies. So, you know, I had to like, okay, let me clean up some of that stuff. And and so interesting um, is, y y you know, a lot of, it, it's hard not to put this dude, it's hard not to put this dude next to Nolan sometimes because they had very similar beginnings. They they're both peers, had like, for sure. They're literally peers. Like, they both have like these dramas that they started off with. Uh, and, and, and then they, they kind of, ease into the sci-fi-ness of it all uh but regardless uh since kind of the beginning of Denny Villeneuve's career he's always done things that have has seemed visually interesting even though the the story wasn't that interesting or maybe the you know what I mean some maybe maybe everything wasn't all all the way there in the terms of writing or what was happening but he always was a visual storyteller um and 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 I think I think when directors start that way and the other things start to come after that is so it's a W to me. Like when, and when you know that I can move the camera and my budget is $5,000, imagine if my budget is what, what's doing like 180 mil, 190 million, yep. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like imagine what happens when now I get the budget and, 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 and that's how I operate. This dude, Denny Villeneuve was able to 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 take i think some some smaller stories and just i think un understand what it means to 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 go to the movies uh he's been criticized recently about um i think the way the the way he does dialogue in his film i know he, he a lot of people has been like oh, Denny Villeneuve he does not enough dialogue not enough people talking he's even said himself he doesn't like a lot of talking in his movies but that's not really it either though right like he's like a he he's just trying to get people to understand there are more things to movies, to screenplays, to scripts than just the dialogue. There's visual storytelling. That is the part of the point of movies too, is visual storytelling. He's he was able to do that so early in his career. 
and he kind of snuck in man when he after like after like prisoners gets in there and he starts making arrivals and he starts making blade runner he 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 just slowly i think cemented himself um as one of those sci-fi directors and it's also interesting about him is he always almost loves the source material i know that sounds like very obvious but it's not always that obvious like uh, uh you you said it dune was like a passion project of his he He's he he watched Dune back in 1984. He read the book a long time ago, and he said, "Oh, I get to do Dune." Yeah, you know, with uh, Denis Villeneuve, man, this uh, this this whole career that he's been able to amass for himself, I think that Dune Part Two now represents the culmination of his entire life's work up until this point. It's the best and the richest expression, I think, of his ideas, his artistry his aesthetic and thematic choices. And it's very similar to what I think we just experienced with Chris Nolan this past summer with Oppenheimer. I I felt the exact same way that it took their entire careers for them to reach the places that they could reach to make these type of films. It it represents 25 years worth of filmmaking knowledge, experience, and skill that's needed to make something on this grand scale. And I think you you started to touch on it. And I want to even kind of take it a step further because in my mind, One of the big challenges and maybe even problems with Hollywood these days is the fact that studios appear to be hiring these independent filmmakers after maybe one or two feature films that they do. And then they get these mega budget, big blockbusters that they're thrown into. Mm -hmm. And I feel like most of the time they're put in positions that they're not necessarily ready for. And it's no fault of the filmmaker, but it kind of feels like a trend that's really taken shape over Hollywood over the past 15 or 20 years, especially with the rise in the ascent of Marvel, who kind of perfected that particular system in their own studio. But a, uh, I think a lot of it kind of feels motivated to, to, to control filmmakers because you have these young new filmmakers who don't have as much of a voice because they haven't been in the industry as long. They maybe have one or two credits under their belt, their belt, really interesting works. They put them alongside a franchise and now they become, they become studio directors. They become hired hands to execute on those visions. And I think about, and not to single anybody out, but I really think that this, this applies in this particular case. I think about Colin Trevorrow with the, with the Jurassic World franchise or Gareth Edwards with Godzilla. Like these guys Mm -hmm, had mm -hmm. directed like one or two films and then they got put into these huge IP driven franchises and they're expected to deliver these really fantastic results. And if you're lucky, if you're good, if you have the studio support behind you that's needed to make that happen, you'll come out on the other side looking really good from it. In the case of Marvel, more often than not, that's worked. But I even think some recent examples where it hasn't worked, and I question the methodology behind that, like, hey, well, maybe the Russos weren't exactly ready to direct things on this type of scale because Mm. they worked well in the studio. But now as we look at all their projects post-Marvel, we're questioning their quality and their skill. Or even mm-hmm. somebody recently, like Nia DaCosta, who's kind of openly talked about that she wants to get she wants to get back to small scale stuff. And I think after her experience with the Marvels, she had only made like two films. She gets mm-hmm. thrown into this huge action driven, big budgeted franchise. Like, was she really ready for that? Perhaps so. Who am I to judge any of that? But I think it I think it's diametrically opposed to how we saw filmmakers like Denis Villeneuve and Nolan start off with their careers and how they rose throughout the industry. You mm-hmm. look at both of them. They started an independent film, and then they eventually worked their way into the Hollywood studio system. That That's not where they started. Chris Nolan was making Following and, 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 and Memento, and Denis mm. Villeneuve was making all these, these foreign language independent films, and then he made Insandi, and then that got, that got the attention Later. of the studios. Mm. And then they allowed these filmmakers to come in and make things for the studio, but not $200 million projects medium-sized projects that that can showcase their their talents and their abilities nolan made movies like insomnia that's the movie that got him the dark knight trilogy denis villeneuve made prisoners that's the movie that catapulted him into the future to make films like sicario a little bit more money then sicario leads into blade runner and arrival and all these huge big budget spectacles these guys have been working they've been honing their craft and building their careers they didn't start off making one film and then all of a sudden they're directing a marvel Mm -hmm. or dc project no, mm-hmm. like they they actually worked at it. And I think that that's just going to time and time again prove to be the way to go because we yep. often have these conversations now like who's in their league? Who's in the league of Chris Nolan and Denis Villeneuve in this generation? Not really anybody. You can't compare them to the legends like Spielberg and Scorsese. They've been doing it. They come from yeah. a completely different generation. But of that generation, 
it's not many people capable of making films on this type of level. And that's truly, I think, because they spent years and years and years honing their craft to be able to get to this level, to earn the trust and to earn the ability to call the shots. And now we see Chris Nolan. He can go to Universal and ask for whatever he wants and they'll give it to him because he's proven time and time again he's capable. Denis Villeneuve, he's going to be in the exact same predicament from here on out, I think. He's going to be able to make whatever he wants for the rest of his career for as long he wants to as, as long as he wants to make movies cuz he's proven time and time again that he's reliable that he's of quality and 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 he's earned the right to be considered an auteur in his respective generation and so i think that that's that's just such a difference maker when we talk about directors in the landscape now and why films look the way that they do why films end up mm-hmm. certain type of ways that they do and why we 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 rarely experience movies like an Oppenheimer and, and a Doom Part 2 where it's like damn we only get that like once a year and 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 it's probably coming from a legend who's been working for 50 <laughs> years you know right. in the case of these guys they're relatively new like you said they haven't made a ton of films they both have like 11 or 12 films not necessarily a ton compared to maybe 30 plus or 40 plus but they're getting there and they're going to be able to work for as long as they want to in the future. So um, I love the path that he's taking. I think it's the smart path. And I think that that's why he's an elite level filmmaker at this particular time. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot here. We won't have to yeah. do this in order, but if you got to pick your top five Denis Villeneuve films out of his entire <laughs> filmography, because we both have seen pretty much all of yeah. his movies at this point, you ain't got to order them. Cause that, that's a lot of pressure at this point, And we're still kind of <laughs> thinking about doing part two, but if you just had to pick his five best works, in his career, what what would those look like for you? Um, Prisoners, man, I'll never forget. It was like, what's funny is when Prisoners came out, I did, I still didn't even have like, I had really hadn't studied directors like that. Like, I wasn't, I didn't walk out of Prisoners twenty thirteen like Den- Denny Villeneuve. What a good director! Like, I didn't, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it wasn't me yet, you know what I'm saying? But it's funny because now I remember, and I was like. This is I remember walking out saying, damn, I think I just watched one of my favorite movies. And and now it's just all starting to make sense to me. Uh, but Prisoners, for sure. That was like one of my first big impressions. Prisoners, Blade Runner 2049, Arrival. I think Arrival is one of the most underrated sci-fi movies of all time. It's literally a spaceship comes out of nowhere and there's like no warfare. There's not a ton of killing or anything. It's like a dialogue. I love that movie so much. I think he really killed it. Um, what do I have? I have Prisoners, Arrival, Blade Runner 2049, Sicario. Boy, oh boy. When I say that, didn't even know it was about tension, y'all. I don't think y'all understand. In every single one of the movies I just said, there's tension masterfully done. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and say it, dude. Doom Part 2 is, 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 is I got to put it there already for sure, without a doubt. Those are my five. Yeah, that, that's that. Those are strong picks. I, I'll start with Sicario. Incredible, incredible movie. If you want more of Josh Brolin in a Denis Villeneuve film, watch Sicario. Uh, I, I think I could put Doom Part Two in there right now. I will put in Blade Runner twenty forty nine as well. Prisoners would be four, and I'll say Insandi at, at number five for me. A um, banger. The the ending of that movie is. Uh, I, I, it's wild it's really wild the places that, that movie goes. it's a slow burn but it's it's one of the most shocking endings that i've seen in quite some time so uh all just incredible films that 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 he's just amassed over the years um in in in, in addition to him you know he can't do it by himself he has to have mm-hmm. really talented people both in front of and behind the camera and i think we've raved a lot about the the technical aspects just the the, the, the best of the best that he's assembled in Hollywood, the Greg Frazier's and the Hans Zimmer's like the people Roger that just Deacons, make think. this come yeah, to life. Crazy. Like he's just worked with, you know, some of the best to, to, to develop his movies. And of course, doing part two, but in front of the camera, uh, we, 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 we would be remiss to not mention how phenomenal this cast is. I mean, this, this is the perfect combination of an older generation of really experienced actors and tomorrow's movie stars, if you ask me. And I really want to kind of hone in and talk about four people in particular who somehow have all ended up in the same movie, kind of at very similar points in their (laughs) careers. And I think we're going to look back on this moment 10 years from now, like, how the hell did that happen? Those four were in the same movie at the same time in a big, mega-budgeted blockbuster. It's kind of crazy, but that's Timothy Mm -hmm. Chalamet, of course, Zendaya, Austin Butler, and Florence Pugh. The core four, baby who right now are, again, establishing themselves as not only some of the most famous actors working, like these people are super famous and super well-known, 
I think if you had to come up with a 35 under 35 list, they would absolutely be in the top 10, probably your top five, if we're being honest about it. But in addition to all that, in addition to the glitz and the glam and the hype and the Instagrams and the photos and the Gen Z of it all, these are also really interesting actors. It's not like they're talentless. Mm -hmm. They're good. They're really, really good at their jobs. And I know you and I, we've been following a lot of them for a long time now because they are very close in proximity to our age and our generation. And we've been able to see some of their earlier films and see them ascend to now reach a place where they're starting to hit a new stride. And I think the, 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 the most interesting thing is that their prime is still ahead of them. They're nowhere near their prime years yet. If they continue at the pace that they're on, the best is yet to come. But the mm -hmm. fact that these four are in this movie at the same time, what does that mean to you? What does that say that Denis Villeneuve, his casting team, they were able to get, I think, you know, probably four of the most famous actors of this generation right now in the same <laughs> movie at the same time? Yeah, man, uh, he 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 really is a, a, a lucky guy, but he's also very calculated. These these those 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 four actors are, you know, I've I, I been kind of talking about this with somebody else, too. I, I actually forgot who it was, but we we're talking about Zendaya. And I was like, Zendaya is absolutely a movie star, but she'll always, I think right now, she'll always kind of feel like a Margot Robbie in the point of like, she loves to act. So she's always going to be in very like nerdy, complicated scripts. You know what I mean? Like she's, she, they're always going to be, they're, they're always going to be kind of of that ilk. And I think these four actors fit that as well. Um, and, and, and they all just really like to act, but that's their beginnings. They all come from that. They all have done these small independent films and have risen to the to the, to the stage that is Doom Part Two. They have they have they've they've also had long careers, even though they are new and they're not in their prime. They've been here, um, and 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 they've been and they've been working and choosing projects correctly. I think something that separates these four from a lot of the other people in Hollywood is they must have bomb agents. Like all four of these the people, the best of the best, have to be. They have been in tremendous movies. Like they have all just been killing it. And so, uh, man, I, I, I think that they'll, they'll only continue to do that. Um, I think that's another thing that makes them special is they know at a young age that I'm just not going to go into any movie. I'm just not going to pick any movie. I'm just not going to be in anything. And I think uh, uh, Denny Villeneuve has earned, I think, the trust of Hollywood, right? I mean, Prisoners has... Viola Davis, <laughs> Jake Gyllenhaal, Hugh Jackman. Again, this is twenty. This is over ten years ago. This dude had these actors in his movie. Um, Paul Dano. Look where they are now. Look where those actors are. You know what I mean? And and, and so I think um, um, coming into this, their agents, them as actors, knew that they could trust somebody like this who clearly loves to give his actors good work. And so uh, I think that's what makes them special. They know exactly what they want to be in. They love to act. I know that still sounds crazy, but some people, again, just want just want to be movie stars. Some people just want to be in blockbusters. Those aren't these four people. This is that's not Austin Butler. That's not Zendaya. That's not Timothy Chalamet. Uh, 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 that's not that's not uh, who am I missing? Florence that's not Florence Pugh. Pugh. Mm -hmm. That's not Florence Pugh. They are going to be in small movies. That girl was in Hereditary. Let's talk about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> these are not the same. Uh, these are not, they, they don't take the same path that some other actors might uh, attempt to take. And so, man, that's what makes them special. And that's what they're going to continue to make them special is their love for the work and their ability to choose the, the right work. And, and Doom Part 2 is, I think, a very good example of that. Yeah, I, I'll start with Timothy Chalamet, who I admittedly had been skeptical of for a few years there, wondering, like, OK, is this going to be the next guy up? And honestly, to see his rise as a leading man, it's really, really amazing. And 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 he he's just done such interesting work up until this point, you know, films like Call Me By Your Name or The King or Little Women, French Dispatch. He's worked with these really, really prominent filmmakers, Wes Anderson, now Denis Villeneuve and, and Luca Guadagnino with Bones and all like he is taking mm -hmm, really interesting mm -hmm. work. And then he can still go and be a part of this Dune franchise and showcase in, in particular in this movie why he's more than capable to lead this into the future. And then also goes and does a Wonka movie, a movie I admittedly am not a fan of, but it just made over $600 million at the box office. It solidifies him as a movie star. And let's be clear, being an actor and being a movie star are not the same thing. Everybody that's an actor mm -hmm. suddenly ain't a movie star. We probably got... We probably got enough movie stars that we can count on two hands, maybe, if we're lucky Thanks. at that. That guy is primed to be a movie star for a very, very long time. And I think it's interesting because a lot of parallels have been drawn between him 
and Leonardo DiCaprio. And mm-hmm. he considers Leo a mentor. I think the parallels are pretty apt at this point. You know, for mm-hmm. a long time there, Leo had always been taking interesting work. But I think what's interesting that we're also kind of experiencing now with Chalamet, who's only 26 years old, if I'm not mistaken, they're still in that period, or, you know, in the case of Leo, for a long time, all the 90s and even the early 2000s, he was in that period where, yeah, he was doing more mature films. He was doing films like Catch Me If You Can and, and, mm-hmm. and The Aviator, but he still kind of felt boyish. He hadn't felt like a fully grown man yet. I think a lot of the roles that he was taking kind of put, it, put him in a, in a really youthful light. It wasn't until 2006 when he did both Blood Diamond and The, De- the Departed when everybody was like, oh, no, this guy is it. He's a man. He's a he's a fully grown yeah. man. He's a grown man. And now we have to perceive him that way. And he's been on an unprecedented run since then. He was 32 years old when he made those movies. And I think that Chalamet is kind of getting there a little bit quicker. I think he still has a little bit of those boyish elements to him. He could still play somebody really young and, you know, play somebody in his early 20s or maybe even late teens if he wanted to. But I think what he does here in Doom Part 2 And what he's going to continue to do in other films that he takes on, he's going to showcase like, no, he's ready to be that leading man. He's ready to be viewed in that in in that in that particular light. Um, Zendaya, I mean, come on. She she's quite literally one of the most well-known, famous people on Earth. She's one of the leads of the MCU's Spider-Man franchise. She's crushing it on Euphoria. Youngest two time Emmy winner in history. A fashion fucking icon everywhere she goes. Um, And I saw somewhere interesting. I, I saw an interesting stat that. All eight of the live action movies that she's been in up until this point, all eight theatrical releases that have had mm-hmm. proper theatrical releases have crossed $100 million at the box office. Mm. She's never been a part of something that didn't make at least $100 million at the box office. Uh-oh. That's insane. That challengers hit rate gotta hit is, it. and that's going to be interesting <laughs> to see what Challengers does. Can Zendaya open a movie, a very small movie, probably a really intimate story that's not going to have a hundred million dollars in marketing. Can she open a movie successfully on that scale? I'm, I'm really excited to see what that looks like for her, but she, she is obviously heading towards just a path of fame and, and, and potentially fortune um, that that's rarely seen Austin Butler, his superstar making performance in Elvis that obviously sent him over the top. Um, mm-hmm. I'm watching masters of the air right now on Apple TV plus he's a great lead in that bike riders is hitting the summer. Uh, his ability to manipulate and contort himself and cultivate a new character and a new voice is is ridiculous. He 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 practically takes on because he's the nephew of the Baron in this movie. <laughs> he perfectly is able to to take on the Stellan Skarsgård accent, which I, I was yeah. not ready for, but he like nails it perfectly. If you embarrass our family once again, we'll kill you. Like you know, they just they said just uh, goes when he it. pulled up when he pulled up the set, he still had his Elvis accent. They said. <laughs> look and 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 look he had to he had to do a lot of work to get rid of it because that's a hard accent i mean even when you see him now doing promo for the movie on jimmy kimmel or the tonight show he still kind of sounds like elvis and it's like yo he mm-hmm. really he sank himself into that role i wonder how long he's going to sound like stellan Skarsgård. but that guy super interesting super versatile and then of course uh florence Pugh. i mean she's just she's always a presence in her movies midsommar oppenheimer don't she's worry amazing. darling Obviously, what she's done with the MCU, Black Widow, Thunderbolts is going to come out. I'm sure she's going to steal the show. Um, the fucking headpieces that she had on this movie, 10 out of 10. Costume department, 10 out of 10. She looks yes. amazing. She always has incredible screen presence. And so, yeah, as I said, I think we're going to look back on this moment and say, like, wow, this is really, really special. That these four, you know, cross paths at the same time. It might, it might not happen again, you know, for this particular generation. Um, all that being said, who do you think the MVP of the movie was? It doesn't have to be one of those four. It can be out of any of the cast, like who do you think kind of walked away as like the, the biggest shining star after their performance in the movie? Cause there's a lot. There is a lot, man. Um, I think on the surface, Javier Bardem, for sure. I think he's a fan favorite. I think he was too, too much of a presence in that movie, like giving us everything that we needed uh, from him. Cause he did dictate a lot of the politicalness of what was happening in the world uh, uh, of Arrakis. I have to give it to Javier Bardem. And I also think, he brought something to the character a lot of actors wouldn't have. Like I, I I'm thinking about other people who might have been in a in in, in the, uh, the situation to play Stillgard. I'm like, nah, it had it had to be Javier Bardem here because I think he conveyed exactly what he needed to convey and brought some new things to the role too. That's like outside of the book, outside of uh, 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 the original Dune 1984 as well. He just he really killed it. I think under the surface, I know this is crazy, but I really like Rebecca Ferguson's like what she had to do in this film 
was every time she was on screen was like, this woman is put it on the acting clinic. Like, is anybody else seeing this? And I guarantee you, not a lot of other people talking about doing, I got to talk about Rebecca Ferguson in this way, man. But she was doing some really good lifting in this movie anytime she was on the screen. I absolutely loved her performance here for sure. Yeah, uh, Javier Bardem is having the time of his life throughout the course of this movie. He's become the biggest meme from Dune. I mean, I've seen so many <laughs> Stilgar memes since yeah. that damn movie came out because what he so expertly does, I mean, he has to do something really, really complicated because he is a lot of the the levity in the movie. He's a lot, he's a lot of the comedic relief because there's this, without giving too much away, there's this uh, – this fanaticism that he has for Paul Atreides as being the Messiah. He is a believer to his core, and mm-hmm. nothing wavers that belief. And a lot of those beats are played for comedy expertly early on in the film, but then there's a certain point in the movie where that changes, where it's not funny anymore. That is who he is. That's unquestionably who he is. Like, this is not a game to him. He is a believer of the prophecy. And to be able to balance that at the same time, Javier yes. Bardem, he's a special kind of actor to be able to do that. Um, I also saw somewhere that this is actually the first time, which is kind of crazy to think about because they've worked together. This is the first time that Javier Bardem and Josh Brolin have technically shared the screen together. Uh, everybody mm. knows them because of No Country for Old Men. Mm. They were they were at That's odds crazy. in that movie, two opposing forces. But if you've seen that movie, you notice that they, they never, never cross paths. On screen together. They're never on screen together. That's that's a lot of the movie and what it's about. And I think that this was the first time that they actually shared a scene together. Dang, um, or a couple not of they know single actors. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> and even, even I, well, I can't give that away, but there's a couple, you know, Batista's in this movie. I haven't uh-huh. thought about Thanos yeah, and Drax, you. you know. So mm-hmm. that was really, really fun stuff to see. Um, I just want to also call out Charlotte Rampling as the Reverend Mother. Uh, oh, love, my God. Love her. Love She's her so in this good. movie. She is so she good. like five minutes 10 minutes of screen time and she's like going amazing. stupid yeah absolutely <sighs> amazing uh there's a line in this movie it's towards the end where <laughs> something happens to her something crazy oh, like you don't man. expect it and she just says abomination it's like the <laughs> best line delivery in the whole movie i she she's incredible i i, I can't wait to see more of the reverend mother in future movies but yeah it, it's chock full of just incredible performances it's really hard to just pick one um, last thing before we close out our Doom Part 2 conversation, the sequel, the next film. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Ideally, the, the conclusion to this trilogy of films that Denis Villeneuve is say, setting out to make. Um, they haven't greenlit it officially, Doom Messiah. Doom Messiah is technically the second book, which will make up the third movie if they're able to do it. But I, I think by all accounts, we're seeing the box office is there. This movie literally doubled the performance of the first movie. It made $82.5 million in the opening weekend, largest opening weekend in the United States since October. Um, it, it, it's, it's poised to make a ton of money, uh, perhaps at least $600 million at the global box office, which is far exceeding what that first film did. And I think would definitely justify a third film being made, but knowing a little bit of the, the, the story to doom Messiah, what, you know, what you bring to it and, and, and understanding the as a filmmaker and just kind of where he's at, what are your hopes for that? Cause I know he's talked about going away, doing another film, you know, off to the mm-hmm. side and then returning to doom Messiah. I think that's a smart thing to do. Um, yeah, but sure. ultimately, like, what's your what's your hopes for 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 what that movie might be? And if we'll get it, you know what this could mean if he's able to deliver another home run on the level of Doom Part One and Doom Part Two, if he's able to close out this trilogy and perhaps give us, you know, maybe one of the greatest the greatest film series that we've ever seen, potentially. Yeah, I have a crazy commentary on that. And, and that is Dune. In case the people listening to this don't know, heavily inspired Star Wars. I don't know if. If you pay attention, y'all, I mean, it's a kid on a desert planet who's supposedly the one. Let's talk about it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> very, very heavily inspired. Star Wars, to put it quite frankly, Star Wars ain't doing it right now, y'all. <laughs> they are not, they have not been firing on the cylinders they need to be firing on. Episode seven and eight, I like them. I don't love them. Dune, I, I am, I can now say I love these films in Dune. And, and, and part of me feels like Dune is kind of taking the place of what Star Wars is supposed to be. We've talked about it on the podcast where Star Wars used to be this event. It used to be this thing that we, even the pre, the prequel trilogy, right? That's where we kind of grew up in, in the prequel trilogy. But we, we were excited to go to the movies to see this world of Star Wars. And I think if, 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 if Denis Villeneuve is able to return and finish Dune Messiah, which that movie gets really weird. <laughs> that story gets really weird. <laughs> if he's, but if he's able to return and do what he d- did here, to be honest, it's going to be, I don't, he doesn't even have to surpass it to me. He just needs to match <laughs> Dune Messiah. 
and we will legit get one of the greatest trilogies of all time and a reason part of the reason i bring up star wars is because this this story one two and three does feel so comparable to 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 the original trilogy that we get in star wars this movie does feel like empire strikes back to me as i'm watching it when i left i was like damn no that's how i can imagine that's how people have empire strikes back feeling like this is one of the greatest sequels of all time and now uh and the thing is he has a, a, a an opportunity to make Doom Messiah, if we're going side by side, Doom Messiah even better than what Return of the Jedi was. The technology is there. He's there's just so much there. I think that 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 he's able to accomplish. So I'm really excited that Doom Messiah, um, if it gets made, I'm pretty sure it will. He said he it will that it it will be it will go down as one of the greatest trilogies of all time. And I'm to be honest, just excited to be part of that. Just as I wasn't able to be there for the original Star Wars trilogy. You know what I mean? I was here for. Other things, for sure. I was here for Lord of the Rings, one of the greatest trilogies ever. I wasn't, I, w- I wasn't there for Star Wars, and, and and I think Dune is giving me the feeling of like, man, maybe this is what it was like when Star Wars first came out. Maybe this is how people felt being able to sink their teeth into into this world. Um, not only that, but Dune Messiah, he's going to be able to play with Florence Pugh more. He's going to be able to play with Ian Taylor Joy more. You know, he's getting some. There's some stuff he's going to be able to do that makes me. It it it, it only makes me just uh, more excited um for for what's to come man and i think he's able to do it my only worry is after all this is you know the studios and be like all right y'all we got to make the rest of the books after dune and then he's not going to be part of those movies i'm pretty sure like he's after messiah i think he's done that's a hard undertaking that's a very hard undertaking just how the sequel trilogy to star wars very hard undertaking as we can see um and so again that's way in the future but Something, something to think about is is post Doom Messiah for me. I'm I'm worried that uh, there there is more story to tell. There's there, there's a lot, and so um, especially if he ends the way I think he's going to end. So overall, very excited. Uh, and yeah, man, I I, I think he's going to kill it and, and give us one of the greatest trilogies we've ever seen. Yeah, I, honestly, if we never saw another Dune movie after Doom Messiah, I'd be A-OK. Um, of course, there are six books in the main story, but there's also a ton of prequel books and spinoffs. I mean, they could make this into a long-running, well-oiled machine if they'd like to, which, you know, I think 10 times out of 10 out of Hollywood, that's going to be the case. If it makes money, mm-hmm. if it's good, they're going to make more. So it, it would be a fool's errand to think that that they're not going to go that way, even if Denis Villeneuve steps away from the franchise. But that being said, I think uh, what we've seen here with part two, I, I've seen a lot of the conversation comparing it to, to, to great film trilogies and great sequels. Chris Nolan himself has talked about how this is sort of the empire strikes back of this generation, which I think that there's a lot of validity to that because when you talk about the progression from movie one to movie two, this yeah. is very similar to what we saw with star Wars and the empire strikes back. But I also think there's other, some, some, some other like decent comps, you know, when you think about like the dark mm-hmm. Knight, you know, the dark Knight yep. in comparison to that first movie, like the central theme of that is, is the hero overcoming the, the antagonist overcoming the villain at a very terrible cost. It, it pretty much mm-hmm. cost Bruce Wayne everything in that movie to overcome the Joker. And we're seeing a lot of the similar themes come out in Paul Atreides or even comparing it to the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the original trilogy, the two towers, very much feeling like that middle chapter. We know the story is not done. We know that there is a resolution that still has to come in the next book. And, and honestly, if you do know anything about Dune Messiah, you could theoretically just cut shit off there. Like the way that they could end it, could just be it like they could easily just kind of break away if they wanted to is that likely probably not if we're able to get another amazing film out of it but that being said as long as Denis Villeneuve is is able to get that third film out and do it on the same terms that he's been able to do it on I'm I'm 1000 percent here for it, totally supporting that obviously and and another thing that I just want to quickly mention before we, we, we wrap up as as important he as he is to this whole thing it's also Equally as important that he has trusting studio partners backing mm-hmm. him up, and that's that's Legendary Pictures because yes. I was reading an article before we recorded about the head of Legendary Pictures, and they were talking about the financing of the movie and how they were kind of uncertain if they were going to make a second movie, but they felt confident because the vision was so strong. And so they did soft preparation on Dune Part 2 without going into full production, just based off of the strength of the movie and based off of the strength of what Denis Villeneuve had delivered to them. And they mm-hmm. stuck by him and they stuck by his vision. And now they're seeing how incredible the results are. 
and he's also a producer on the films. And so when we talk about budgets and the look of the film, the guy has shown that he's responsible, that he can deliver a movie on a decently, modestly, you know, level budget. Because we're, we're talking about these other films that have budgets in excess of $300 million. And I'm looking like, well, where's the money at? Because the movie doesn't look, it doesn't look that great. What, what happened? <clears throat> Fast X. Listen, listen, if you compare <laughs> Fast X, if you compare Fast X to Doom Part 2, which there really is no comparison, for, but forget the quality of the movie. Just look at the budgets. Fast X costs like what? Three hundred and sixty million dollars. Three forty. Yeah. Three hundred and forty million dollars. Put that next to Doom Part Two, which costs one ninety, and tell me which movie looks better. <laughs> Ain't really no conversation, bro. bro. Come but on, man. There is no conversation, but that just goes to show once again you got somebody who knows what the fuck they're doing. You got somebody who's trusted and respected, honed his craft. He knows exactly how to spend the money adequately and correctly to make something that I don't not only looks amazing. But he's putting every dollar he can on the screen. And so, again, as I said, having trusting studio partners, having people that back you and understand what you're going to do here, that's just as important as this whole thing because we've seen time and time again where that's not been the case. So plenty to look forward to out of the future of the Dune franchise. And whenever we do get Dune Messiah, whether it's in four or five, six years, whatever, I'm going to be here waiting for it. And if you've not seen Dune Part 2, you should certainly go check out this movie. But if you have, hit us up and let us know what you think about this movie.